Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Test Auto Channel. In accordance with the core mission of this channel, today we're going to talk about steampunk. Yes, I know that oftentimes I talk about sci-fi and fantasy in general because I love those things and I sometimes talk about history as well because that is an important element in steampunk fiction. But Sometimes we have to get back to our roots, and today is one of those days. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the elements, the important elements of steampunk fiction. Today my topic is the important elements of steampunk fiction. And I was working on some other, other ideas for video topics and they all proved to be rather more research and preparation intensive than I'd hoped. So in the interest of keeping this channel going with my weekly video, I'm doing something where I can draw on my general knowledge of steampunk and do it a little bit more extemporaneously. In the process of doing some of this research, I came across a site called punkaesthetics.com. And it was interesting because, first of all, there was no particular person or organization associated with it. They didn't appear to be selling anything. They didn't have any ads or whatnot. And at the same time, it was a good introduction to steampunk as far as what it is and what kind of movies or so on, particularly movies, that a person could consider to be steampunk. And it's kind of a good jumping off point for somebody who says, well, I find this interesting. What could I watch that might fit into this genre? So I did appreciate this site. And it's weird, though. I wish they would have a name associated with it because I like to I like to see who's who in the steampunk community and all I could find out on the ICANN the I-C-A-N-N -N site is that it's registered in Iceland this anonymous person I will refer to him as a he <laughs> in the time-honored Victorian tradition of using the masculine for an indefinite pronoun so, one of the things I found most interesting on this site, and this is going to be the jumping off point for my discussion, is what are the important elements of steampunk fiction? And his list is called the top 10 things to look out for in a steampunk movie. So, I think that some of these things are true and others I will strongly disagree with. But take it as you take it as you will. This is my opinion, of course. Number 1, the use of steam. Well, of course. Steampunk has the word steam in it, right? And this is his quote. In steampunk, electricity has never been invented. Everything is mechanical and powered by steam. Okay, first disagreement. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Electricity has been invented. In fact, one of the primary historical figures that's often written into steampunk fiction is Nikola Tesla, the genius inventor and prophet of electricity. How could he be in steampunk if electricity hasn't been invented and or discovered? The point is that steam is used because it's the most practical and economical energy source of the time. And it totally revolutionized human society, our economics, our politics, and our culture, eventually because of the Industrial Revolution. So it is important, but electricity was there. The problem is that battery technology was in its infancy, and as was electric, electrical distribution networks uh, that were just starting to appear at the end of the 19th century. So this person goes on to say, if there is digital machi machinery in a movie, it isn't traditional steampunk, therefore it may be classified as steampunk inspired. Well, I'll agree with that. If you're talking digital computers, yeah. Number two, steam powered vehicles. This kind of follows from number one. <laughs> yes, in steampunk movies, says he, as with the above, you will only see vehicles powered by steam cars 
It includes car ships and even submarines. Yes and no. You will see animal-powered vehicles, of course. You'll see horse-drawn drawn carriages. You'll see bicycles, which were becoming very popular at the time, with, that are human-powered. So definitely not. And in fact, um, in Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, I believe the Nautilus submarine was powered by like a sodium reaction of some sort. That's not steam. So there are exceptions, but the point is that the modern internal com combustion engine isn't prevalent and battery technology is very, very uh, limited. Number three, airships. Airships are popular within the steampunk genre, again mechanically powered. Totally agree with this. I did a video on airships. Airships are cool. Airships have this kind of majestic quality that airplanes do not. And you, I will put in a link to my video on that. You can get a little bit more about that. I'm not going to expound on it here. Number four, set in Victorian era or in alternate history. This is actually part of my definition of steampunk fiction. That yes, it is set in the Victorian era, roughly the 19th century, because Queen Victoria reigned for an awfully long time, so with a little bit of overlap. And in America, we call this the Gilded Age. So it doesn't mean that it can't take place in America or other places. And this person goes on to say, or in an alternative future, occasionally de depicted as Wild West settings. Yes, true. And also fantasy. Don't forget fantasy settings. For example, China Mieville's excellent New Crobazon series, which is often viewed as steampunk because of this fictional world, because of how the technology, what level that's at, and they're often go out, going out on steamships or sailing ships, and uh, what their culture is like, very class stratified. Number five, the clothing. Clothing can vary, but is normally focused around the fashions of Victorian England or that of a colonial explorer. Uh, yeah, because this, this one leaves room for expansion, I'll have to agree. Uh, Wild West, Western cowboy clothing is popular. Uh, military uniforms of the period, that's another big thing, like say the Civil War in America, or maybe the Napoleonic Wars, I know that's a little bit before uh, the Victorian era, but nonetheless, uh, definitely other types of clothing. So, number six, augmented mechanical humans. And this is a very popular element that's not mandatory. Uh, it was big in Bonesart Buckle's steampunk novel, his upcoming one called Bound for the Sticks. And, and that's a big part of then, which is one of the reasons I like his fiction so much. He has this channel, Radio Record Future, uh, also on YouTube, so I'd recommend that. But yes, Mechanical humans are very popular in that, not in every story, and of course, mechanical men and women <laughs> that also are a big deal. And that's something that this particular statement overlooks. Number seven, gadgets and gears. Futuristic mechanical gadgets are in common place in the steampunk genre. A personal favorite is a gun that mechanically springs from up a sleeve to the user's hand ready and poised for use. And gears can be seen throughout the steampunk genre, of course. And though, as popular as gears are, they're not mandatory. And a lot of steampunk gears are nowhere to be seen. Like, for example, Mieville's New Crobazon fantasy series. And a lot of times they're kind of beneath the surface. If you talk about you know, carriages, uh, soulless, uh, I guess it's parasol protectorate. It's more about... Uh, the people and the, the society than actually mechanics, but it's still steampunk. Number eight, time travel. Time travel is not an essential component of steampunk, however, it can be seen in some steampunk works. Yes, agree, agree. And this, he goes on to add, just remember, remember that the time travel device needs to be mechanical and not digital slash electronic. Uh, not so important, but I don't know how time travel can exactly be mechanical. For example, in H.G. Uh, Wells' Time Machine, yeah, he's powering a bicycle that has some kind of a spinning thing on it. Uh, but this kind of almost implies an electrical component to it. In fact, that would make a lot more sense. So I don't entirely agree with that. 
And yeah, time travel is problematic. It's a, it's a difficult thing to write around and to have the story make sense. So I currently don't work with that. And there's a number of other very, uh, very, very good ones, like Tim Powers, The Anubis Gates. But most of them don't have it. Number nine, The Paranormal, also agreed. Uh, as I cited uh, Gail Carriger's uh, Solus series, which is very paranormal. There's vampires and werewolves in Victorian society, and they're actually a recognized part of society. There's, there, there are vampires in Parliament, <laughs> which, and they're kind of like now, only they're, <laughs> they're just metaphorical ones, right? He says, the paranormal is not traditional steampunk. However, the crossover between the genres is common. Agreed. At the same time, we have to recognize that the paranormal was often considered to be scientifically valid in this era. They had this spirit photography, they had people believed in fairies, people believed, believed in, in, in uh, communication with the dead through mediums and so forth. From their standpoint, it is scientifically plausible. Uh, number 10, advanced technology. Technology that is advanced for the time is a standard theme throughout steampunk. The technology must be mechanical. Again, disagree. <laughs> But uh, the good point is that this is the punk element of steampunk. What distinguishes steampunk from traditional historical fiction is that there's something that's different. Uh, like, for example, technology that didn't come into, a, into common use during that era, like the airship, which was commonly used during the 1920s and 30s. And also, sometimes historical differences uh, sometimes history changed and happened differently. Uh, like, for example, Babbage's computer became, his mechanical computer became very uh, successful as in The Difference Engine, as in that famous novel. These historical differences also make steampunk very fascinating and a refreshing alternative to traditional historical fiction. So that's the ten. That's the list. And that pretty much sums up what I also agree to be the main elements of steampunk fiction, with the exception that they forgot about these. <laughs> they forgot about goggles. I mean, I know it's kind of minor, but it's something that's so omnipresent in steampunk fashion and so on, that uh, there are websites called Brass Goggles and so, so forth. There are songs written about it. So... It's got to be in the list somewhere. So they forgot that one. In conclusion, I'd say that I really like this website. It's, it's got some cool ideas. I don't necessarily agree what, with their list of steampunk movies. Some are, and some, in my view, are not. But you might check it out and see what you think yourself. Because uh, I'm not going to go into that right now. So, this has been my video on the elements of steampunk fiction, the mandatory and or optional elements, as inspired by the website punkaesthetic.com. Please like and subscribe to my channel, and please comment too, I'd love to see those, uh, but I especially want the subscriptions because I want to get out the good steampunk gospel, spread it around, get steampunk back into fashion. I also want to get enough subscribers so I can do a Kickstarter. Because if you like steampunk, I'm producing it. And I have some steampunk novels out there that I'd like to get adapted to the audiobook, but I have to hire a narrator. Secondly, I have some ideas for graphic novels. Just like uh, Mr. Bonsard Balkel of Radio, Radio Retrofuture has done. I'm not an artist. I have zero talent in that respect. So I need to hire somebody. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.